Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm Bill Bain. I work at Scaleout Software. And I'm going to talk to you about doing data parallel analytics integrated with stream processing using in-memory data grids. So I'm the founder of Scaleout Software. We were founded in 2003, been in the market since 2005. And we build middleware software called in-memory data grids, software that runs on a cluster of commodity servers. And it does two main things. One is it allows you to store fast changing data in an object oriented form as a key value store to scale application performance. And it scales application performance by handling large workloads, very large populations of objects and allowing them to be accessed and updated with very low latency. It also is used for in-memory computing, so the fast-changing data can be analyzed on the fly. And this ability to do integrated in-memory computing with in-memory data storage is one of the key capabilities of an in-memory data grid. And it allows you to have what we call operational intelligence, the ability to introspect on the data as it's changing and provide feedback to a live system or feedback to an, or an alert to an analyst. So this operational intelligence can be differentiated from business intelligence because of the fact that we're integrating online data parallel analytics as opposed to having to take the data offline and, and analyze it later and get results later. We've been in the market for 13 plus years. We have 450 customers running on about 12,000 servers. So this is the agenda for today. We're gonna to talk about how an in-memory computing uh, creates this next generation in stream processing, stateful stream processing using the digital twin model. And Abe talked about the digital twin model in the keynote this morning, and we'll talk in some depth about it. In fact, this is gonna get into a code sample in Java, and hope everybody wants to see some code, because um, I don't think a talk like this would uh, be complete without a little bit of code, right? So, um, so we'll talk about some of the challenges for today's stream processing and how People uh, up till now have not really looked at the digital twin model for stateful stream processing and some of the problems that creates. We'll talk about how you can add context to stream processing to make it stateful, but do it in a coherent software architecture, which the digital twin model provides. We'll give a background on in-memory data grids and then how they fit for this application usage, namely the digital twin model. And we'll look at several examples and then uh, the code uh, for those, for one example, and then hopefully there'll be time for a demonstration at the end by my colleague Oleg Schmitov, who's sitting here. So one of the key uh, things you should get out of this talk is how you can do stream processing along with data parallel analytics in, on the same data in the grid. And, and that's really the, the next step in stateful stream processing, uh, not to just process events, but to do data parallel analytics so you can introspect on aggregate behaviors and provide feedback back to the sources of the data, also to the analysis algorithm, and thirdly, to humans uh, in real time. So let's look at some of the, what are the goals for stream processing. And it's really to handle many, many events coming in from many data sources, to somehow make sense of those events, correlate them, then analyze them, and generate feedback, and then look at what it's telling us about the physical systems that are generating those events. And uh, you can see there are many applications for that. Uh, there's IoT applications, the classic windmill farm. Um, there's also uh, human-based uh, data sources like shoppers in an e-commerce site or runners wearing watches. And, uh, and then there's other applications in fraud detection, financial services, uh, stock trading, medical applications, medical telemetry, uh, trying to do analysis predictably uh, of what can happen next so you can prevent bad things from happening and optimize for the behaviors you want. So let's just take a quick look at an application that we've spent some time looking at. And we did a demo of this this morning. We won't do one now. But it's uh, e-commerce recommendations. And one of the things that makes this application interesting is that um, the way people are doing it today does not take into account the shopping goals of the online shopper. It, what typically people do with some of these really big name products that I won't name today, um, is they ingest click streams for the purposes of elaborating a model of the shopper. So they have every shopper, they, have, they keep a model of that person that they uh, 
decorate with more and more knowledge about what brands are the favorite brands, you know, what are the demographics, uh, um, and what are the trends, the social trends, and so forth. And then they try to match that with their inventory, and the goal of which is to maximize the basket size. Um, what we did was said, well, what if you really were just trying to help people find the product they're looking for? You probably had this challenge on, on Amazon or something like that where you're looking for a product and you can't find the right mix of attributes of that product. Uh, you, know, you just have to keep searching and then eventually you stumble on it. Um, so if you could have a real-time system using machine learning techniques that watches every click and then analyzes the clicks also in the context of the shopper's favorite brands and other attributes, but mainly to help the shopper find the right product, that would be a very good stream processing system. And so we spent some time looking at that, and one of the things that we learned in talking to, to people that built these uh, recommendation systems is that you really need to also have aggregate feedback. You have to look at what all the shoppers are doing and then provide collaborative feedback to the shopper so you can tell them, oh, in this category, this is the best-selling product in real time not just what was computed yesterday or over the last month, but to be able to give people real-time feedback on what other people are doing. That's something that shoppers uh, consider extremely valuable. Best-selling products, most viewed products, you know, the, the latest products that are, are hot today, this morning. So these are some of the uh, data parallel uh, uh, results that you want to be able to achieve by looking at all the shoppers while you're helping each individual shopper uh, buy a product. So a way you could do that um, I'll show you in a second. This is the result of what it looks like. Um, so from a shopper's point of view, uh, one could have a frame inside of the uh, web page showing a product that shows recommendations that are being made. So if this shopper is looking for refrigerators, we could say, you know, based on what you seem to be looking for, these are the top recommendations for you. And then you could actually ask, well, why did you pick that one? Why did you pick that one? And then it will tell you, you know, these are the attributes that you wanted. And by the way, some of these are aggregate attributes, like best-selling, most viewed. And then the shopper can interact with that and say, well, actually, I really want this brand, not that brand, and then have the recommendation system within 100 milliseconds refresh these recommendations. So this is a, an assistant to the shopper to find the right products quickly. An example of a stream processing application, which is combining both uh, stream processing with this digital twin model we'll talk about, as well as data parallel analytics in real time. And the data parallel analytics manifest themselves for the merchandiser in the form of a dashboard, which has all of these uh, characteristics of the shoppers as a whole. For example, these are the top five product categories by revenue being shown and being refreshed every few seconds, every 10 seconds. Uh, likewise, you know, uh, how many, uh, what the conversion rate is, the clicks to first view of the product they eventually bought, those kinds of statistics. So all of these statistics can be captured in real time with an in-memory computing system that is doing both event processing and data parallel computing. To motivate why we care about doing both data parallel computing and event processing in a coherent architecture. So if we look at how stream processing architectures typically are design today, if you look at, uh, you know, going back to Apache Storm, but more recently Beam and Flink, um, Spark Streaming, the, the model is that all of these events coming in from these data sources flow into a pipeline, and this could be an, uh, a, a directed graph, but it is, it's essentially a pipeline where they're processing steps and then buffers between the steps where their data is, the, is being held. And that's fine, except that if you think about it, it doesn't have any knowledge of the data sources. There's no mapping back to the data sources. There's no way to keep state uh, that's being guided by the architecture. Um, having a, a good software architecture for building the application is a great lever for simplifying the design and delivering better performance than you would otherwise get. So, then, so you could ask the question, how do you correlate events from the data sources? And then how do you match those events to context, like shopper demographics, for example. And then another question is, where, how do I partition my algorithms? To, and you know, How many stages of the pipeline do you have? I remember when I first read about Storm and the bolts, I thought, oh, the bolts are really cool, but how do I take my problem and map it into bolts? And it wasn't clear to me what that mapping should look like. The architecture is not guiding the application design. And then, of course, how do you have good performance 
uh, for uh, event handling, as well as how do you perform data parallel analytics. There's simply nothing there about data parallel analytics. Uh, there's no model for it because there's no domain for doing the data parallelism. We talked about that this morning a little bit, that the domain, the set of data on which you perform a data parallel operation is key to a successful uh, application using data parallelism. So the way that I have seen stream processing systems evolve is essentially to bolt on storage, a distributed cache or a database, or to talk to a network of databases, for example. Some products do that, uh, mainly for query. And um, the problem with this is that this is unmanaged state, if you will, in the sense that it's up to the application to figure out what to put where and how to access it. And so this creates complexity because there's no software model. And furthermore, it creates a network bottleneck because any time the execution pipeline wants to access state, it has to move across the network because typically the stream processing engine is running on a different server or cluster than the cache or, or grid or database. So there's a lot of network traffic that can impact performance. Um, for example, take a Pama there, that's an example where there's a CEP engine with a terracotta cache, which is separate from the, um, from the execution pipeline for the events. Now, so you say, well, there's the Lambda architecture. I hear that a lot. Well, we should use the Lambda architecture. So if you're familiar with it, this is the Wikipedia picture of it, properly uh, referenced, according to Wikipedia. Um, so it, what it's doing is it says, let's just do batch processing or data parallel processing outside of the speed layer. Speed layer is for real time, and we'll do uh, the rest offline. So this is business intelligence, and this is operational intelligence, but you can't do deep introspection on what's happening in the aggregate uh, in the speed layer, so you'll do it offline and then query for the results. So this is not what me reaching the goal that of what Abe spoke about this morning, the HTAP, or the Gardner's term for hybrid transactional and analytics processing architecture where you're doing both the transaction processing, in this case event processing, and data parallel analytics, and doing all of that in one coherent architecture. So how do you combine stream processing and data parallel analytics uh, with a simple design and high performance in one architecture? And that's where the digital twin model really adds value, which we'll get to once we talk about in-memory data grids. So uh, the reason why the digital twin model works well is it's a very good uh, match in terms of software design to the in-memory data grid architecture. And by the way, uh, slides will be available afterwards, and I'd also be happy to email anybody slides who wants them. So um, just feel free to just ask me at the end. Um, so what is an in-memory data grid? Well, in-memory data grids have been around since uh, early 2000s. They're a software concept it runs across a cluster of commodity servers, and it stores objects as key value pairs in an object-oriented paradigm. So typically, it's used for business logic state, not storage. So it's not a, typically, you don't see uh, relational data kept in a grid, although grid game can do that. Uh, we focused more on uh, key value storage. Um, so uh, because of the fact that it's a simple model that's very fast, and there are specifications like JSR 107 that make it very easy for everybody to understand and use. And uh, so we're storing objects in a grid uh, that are uh, uh, collections by type. And then they're distributed by the grid. What the grid is doing is distributing them across a cluster of servers such that there's location transparency. Any object can be found without knowledge as to what server it's hosted on. And um, High-end in-memory data grids will do automatic load balancing and automatic high availability and maintain a sequential consistency model for accessing the data. Some grids do not do that, like Redis, for example. Does not it has an eventual consistency model. And what we found is for business logic state, sequential consistency is what our customers require. What that means is that a read of, the grid, of a grid object always returns the light, latest update, even if there is a failure or a rebalancing of the data in the grid. So in-memory data grids are great for storage, but it turns out they're running on a cluster of commodity servers that typically have a lot of cores and a lot of servers. So there's a lot of computing power that's really not being used if you're just using a grid for data storage. So grids become a very good uh, platform for in-memory computing as well as data storage because they're leveraging the computing power of the cluster 
and they're avoiding data motion to and from the grid to process that data. And that's why they're a great platform for data parallel computing. So you could do a data parallel analysis of all the objects in a collection, and that gets distributed across the grid. And you also can do stream processing in parallel across many objects in the grid, and we'll talk about that next. So how the grid executes code is that what we do is we spawn uh, our language runtime on each grid server. So there are three grid servers here, each running a service process. We spawn a language runtime, a JVM or .NET runtime, and that's the repository for the code and the, and the execution uh, process for the code of the application doing a data parallel computation or doing stream processing. And that creates a clean separation between the application and the grid service, and it ensures that data only moves locally within the server and one can use memory map files to further speed that up so that data never moves across the network to do a data parallel computation except to merge the results at the end. And it's leveraging the cores and the servers in the grid. So two types of operations are generally done. First, for stream processing, one can have uh, event sources sending events to the grid and they're executed on individual objects in the grid and one of the techniques that we've employed is to use the reactive extensions observer model. So uh, an observer can be brought up on each grid worker, and then when an event is sent, it can be forwarded to a specific object, and it goes to the host of the server on which that object resides. And we'll show you an example of the code for that. And then the reactive extensions observer then calls the user defined code for that object. So it makes for a very low latency, very fast and high throughput, mechanism for processing events coming in from uh, many, many data sources into the grid. So that's parallelism by executing multiple, multiple events at the same time. The other kind of parallelism is running a data parallel operation, such as a MapReduce, that's being invoked, so invoking a parallel method and running that on all the servers on a set of objects that are spread across all the servers and then combining the results. Now a little diversion into data parallelism so this is a basic data parallel execution model that we've implemented. Uh, I worked uh, at Intel supercomputers for many years, and this is the model that uh, I first saw for parallel supercomputers. Uh, it's a basic uh, parallel execution binary merge model, very good for distributed systems because the merge can take place in logarithmic time relative to the number of servers. So it gives uh, fast merging, and you end up with one result, which is very convenient. It's also the foundation for building more extensive models like MapReduce. So uh, what's happening is that a user-defined method can be uh, written. Again, this is an object-oriented implementation of a model that has been around for about 30 years now. So an, uh, um, a user-defined method is used, applied to an object in the grid to generate a result, and then another user-defined method does a binary merge until all the results are combined. Now, it can be used to implement MapReduce by two phases of this algorithm. This algorithm, by the way, is called parallel method invocation. And that's the term we've used for it. And MapReduce is two phases of parallel method invocation. And essentially, all MapReduce is doing that that's elaborates is that it's pre-partitioning the data before uh, the parallel uh, data um, analysis is performed, and there's no global merging at the end. So if you want to do a group by operation or a pivot table in Excel speak, then you use MapReduce. Uh, an example would be, you know, take all the windmills in your windmill farm and compute the average RPM by region. So you'd have four partitions for the four regions. And then you would, uh, so the mappers will just take all the input data and map them to the right partition. And the reducers perform the heavy lifting of the data parallel analysis, the equivalent to the eval. And so again, this is done in two phases with uh, PMI, the first phase and then the second, and it works very cleanly. Now, just so you, just this is just a little um, extra, a little land yop, just so you know that, you know, these are not the only two ways to do this. In fact, uh, we discovered this quite by accident. Um, we have uh, uh, some .NET engineers who are very familiar with this thing called parallel for each in .NET, which I'm guessing most of you don't think about much because mostly a Java audience here. Am I right? Java, .NET, no, there's some .NET, okay, all right. So, um, so it turns out parallel for each has this very nice characteristic that it carries the result along. It's like PMI, 
except that it carries the results along with each evaluation operation. I won't go into this in any detail, except um, each, uh, each object being examined, after it's uh, finished its evaluation, it carries along the result, and so that there's no merging of all the results on a given server, and you don't have as much garbage created of results, intermediate results that have to be thrown away. And if you look at uh, the difference in what the garbage collector does, this is quite stunning, actually, that uh, PMI creates a lot of intermediate results which have to be collected continuously, whereas distributed for each just eliminates that. So th the only point of that little discussion is there are lots of models for data parallelism, and, and as one uses this stuff over time, you learn how to do it better. That's one of the learnings we've had. So now, let's try to bring this together. And the underpinning of all of this, what I'm talking about today, is the digital twin model. And the digital twin model was first created by Michael Greaves at University of Michigan in 2002. And it was not for this purpose that we've co-opted this term and, and this notion of the model for stream processing. It was done for the reason that Abe showed when he showed the GE engines this morning in the keynote. It's for constructing large systems out of lots of subsystems and um, managing them all digitally. So I understand if you go to the Boeing factory, you can walk through the instrument bay you know, digitally and make sure that all the, you know, all the devices don't fit on the racks. And, and so when they go to build the aircraft, it will actually fit together as they expect. Uh, however, that model turns out to be kind of interesting for stream processing because it's a basis for, for correlating events from data sources and for adding context and for doing deeper introspection than you otherwise could do. It's, our, it's somewhat magical in that regard. Um, so what is it doing? It's saying that let's, let's keep an object in the grid for every data source that's generating events. And then we call it its digital twin. And then let's uh, put all the information we know about that, digital, about that data source in the digital twin object. So we don't just have an event collection. We have state information, which is context about that physical data source. And I'll show you some examples that you go, yeah, that makes sense. There's a lot of context. For example, if it's a shopper, right? You know, the shopper's demographics, favorite brands, all that stuff is here. So when an event comes in, you can say, well, that's interesting. They seem to want Nikon cameras, but we know they prefer Canon cameras. Let me show them a Canon camera that's on sale. Maybe they would prefer that. That's an example. Um, so then it also encapsulates the analysis code. And one of the big levers you get out of this is the analysis code can be your favorite machine learning engine. It could be a rules engine. It could be anything you want. Um, it, and in fact, the big challenge that we have as a company in offering a platform is that customers are very application oriented. They usually have proprietary codes, whether it's financial services or medical or whatever your favorite uh, uh, or, um, domain. Their algorithms are proprietary and they need to be encapsulated and kept cleanly separate from the orchestration layer that the grid provides. So what the grid is going to give you with the digital twin model is an orchestration platform, a platform for taking the events and sending them to the right places, kicking off the right user-defined methods, and then letting the application take over and do its work with all the context in the right place at the right time, as opposed to a streaming pipeline where I don't know where you go put the state in the cache somewhere, and by the way, if you want it, you're going to have to go reach across the network to get it. So we're pushing, if you will, the code to the data instead of the data to the code uh, by using this digital twin model. So we can populate the grid with a set of digital twin objects, and there could be thousands, or for e-commerce shoppers, millions in one grid. And then we can always uh, pull data in, historical data that doesn't fit in memory, or push knowledge out, so like as shoppers buy products, we can keep updating a database uh, of, so we learn more and more about them. And then the other really cool thing is that you have now a domain for data parallel analysis because all of these digital twins can be examined with a data parallel operation like we just saw, a distributed for each or a MapReduce, and we can then collect results. And what's really cool, the last step, is we can provide feedback back for the analysis algorithm based on this aggregate knowledge we've gained, or we can send it to an analyst or we can even send it back to the data source itself. So if this is a rental car fleet and you know, uh, we're learning that you know, this driver is very inefficient, or say it's a, a rental truck fleet and this is commercial, um, and some driver is just wasting a lot of gas, you, know, you could pass a message back, you know, stop uh, accelerating so fast or something. So the idea is the feedback can go all the way back. 
So here are some examples of digital twins in some applications, right? Um, many, many areas. IoT is the hot area, and I think, uh, especially based on Abe's slide this morning, I think it's one we want to stay focused on because it's going to really explode over the next uh, few years. But uh, it's a perfect match for the digital twin model because you have all these devices and then they're generating events and you need to correlate the events by device and then you need to analyze based on your knowledge. So if you're doing predictive analytics, right, you want to know the history. If it's a windmill, you want to know, oh, well, when was it last serviced? Oh, did it have high winds last week because there was a, a storm that went through? Um, you know, when is it next due for maintenance? Is this a model that they've just sent a, you know, a directive to that says it's, you've got to replace the blades or whatever it is, there's a lot of context. If you can pull all that together and then look at the events in that context, then you can make intelligent decisions about what to do to predict uh, maintenance actions. Um, medical monitoring is particularly interesting because of the fact that uh, if you're getting telemetry about a patient or a runner in a, uh, you know, that's, we have an example of that, um, then you can uh, make intelligent decisions in real time about whether or not you need to alert the patient or a doctor. We actually talked to uh, some, some people at the State University of New York that were working in this area, not with a digital twin model, but I was told something I, I didn't really understand, which is that when you're in the ICU, um, you know, they walk in periodically, look at the machines, and then they walk out, and they go, yep, he's still alive, you know, it's okay. But the reality is, he says, they have the algorithms and the knowledge that if they could just track every second over the last, you know, 24 hours, they can make a much better prediction about whether or not you're going to need intervention. But the problem is there's not enough personnel to do it, and there's no mechanism for doing it. But a digital twin model could do that, and then create an alert when it sees something anomalous, and people can rush in and then analyze that telemetry and see why uh, the machine learning system thought there was a problem. So many other examples, some that we've looked at, e-commerce, cable TV, and fraud detection. So we'll just keep moving. And uh, so again, you know, what makes the in-memory data grid such a good platform for running digital twins? Well, it should now be obvious, right? Object-oriented storage, so perfect uh, platform for hosting the digital twin models. This ability to do a, a low latency event processing so you can now uh, correlate events through that reactive extensions observer directly to the right objects. You may think correlation is like a trivial problem, but in, in talking with it, several customers, what we found was correlation was the big, the big obstacle. Uh, for example, the cable TV company we worked with, it was taking them six hours to correlate the data. Uh, we talked to a very large pizza company in the U.S., and, uh, and you know, their big problem was they, they didn't have any correlation in real time. They just pushed all of the data from all of their uh, pizza shops all over the U.S. They just put it on disk, and offline they correlated it, and then they could make sense of, you know, is this pizza shop uh, wasting you know, their raw materials or whatever, or, or are they not producing revenue? But the correlation is the central problem, and the digital twin model running on a grid makes that problem essentially go away. Um, very nice for encapsulating application-specific algorithms, and it's also the basis for scalable performance because you can process events in parallel and you can do data parallel uh, aggregation on the digital twin objects. All of that scales naturally with the grid, and it gives you a very good platform for stateful stream processing. You also can extend the scaling out to Kafka um, because Kafka can be partitioned across its brokers and one can map those partitions to grid partitions uh, by telling Kafka what the uh, key mapping algorithm is. So uh, the brokers and partitions m match up. Uh, you can then avoid having events arrive at a grid server and have to be forwarded to another one. And so you can further scale event processing, make it go faster and avoid network overhead. But we won't talk about that in detail today. So, Let's talk about how you would integrate now event processing and data parallel processing with this model. So one of the things you could do uh, when an event comes in is it's going to, first of all, post the event to its event collection, evict events that shouldn't be kept in memory, and then it's going to start analyzing the event. Now, it can draw on offline state as necessary, and it can push state offline as necessary. And then also, while this is going on and an alert is optionally being generated, so this is the event processing being handled uh, independently of data parallel processing. So data parallel analysis can be taking place simultaneously. Uh, the data parallel, uh, parallel evaluation algorithm is reaching in. Again, it's 
it's uh, part of this class design, so it knows exactly how the state is organized. It reaches into that state, extracts the information it needs, and aggregates it. So a very nice, clean, object-oriented design for both event processing and data parallel processing. And we'll show you an example towards the end. So if you look at e-commerce, um, you can have digital twin objects of shoppers with data parallel analysis at the same time. So that was the example we looked at in the beginning. And you can see how as the click streams come in, the recommendations flow out, and at the same time, data parallel analytics is taking place. And that's providing feedback back to the analysis algorithm. It all just fits. Uh, tracking a fleet of vehicles, we talked about a little bit. It's the same architecture, right? The digital twins are the cars or trucks, and the data parallel analytics is computing overall statistics uh, like fuel efficiency for the fleet and positioning logistics for where the fleet needs to be and looking for errant behavior so it could feed back to the driver. So here's an interesting concept that emerged uh, for digital twins. It's not obvious at first blush, which is that um, you can actually build a hierarchy of digital twins uh, which implement a more complex systems than simply having digital twin objects represent, if you will, the leaf nodes of the hierarchy. So these digital twins represent physical devices, but these digital twins represent subsystems, so higher levels of abstraction. So, and, and this is not unlike our nervous system and how our brain operates to some extent, you know, is analogous in the sense that the events coming in here represent the lowest level um, events from the physical world. These represent abstracted events that are coming out of these digital twins. So alerts from this level become events at a higher level. And so as you move up, uh, you can make decisions at higher levels of abstraction than you otherwise could. Well, here is a completely um, hypothetical example that, um, that I have thought about a fair amount. There's a very interesting book about the uh, shuttle Columbia disaster, and, and I don't know how much you guys have read about that. But I don't know if you know what happened when they were reentering the atmosphere, but you know, they got a high temperature warning at the leading edge in the, one of the carbon-carbon panels. And then almost simultaneously, they got this overpressure of the landing gear and then they, of course, the Elevon was fully, um, uh, you know, at, at this full extent uh, to try to avoid the, you know, the yaw that was being created from the drag of the, of the broken panel. So, um, so there's, a, there's a lot going on that's completely unrelated. And if you think about, you know, very complex systems may have events taking place at a low level, but there's nobody watching the store, you know, up higher uh, to see, you know, is there a big problem that we're just, not, we're just missing? Um, and so you can imagine, I just, this is just hypothetical, complete caveat here, just to get you thinking about this notion of a hierarchy. If you had these low level digital twins talking to a higher level twin, which is say it's only interested in structural integrity, and at some point it says, you know, I'm seeing two indicators that make me wonder whether or not there's structural integrity of the vehicle, and it would send an alert to some strategic algorithm. Meanwhile, the flight control system is saying, you know, we're in a mode that we shouldn't be in for reentry. There's a huge amount of yaw, we don't know why. Um, and so this strategic analysis could say, okay, we have you know, the flight controls uh, at their limits, and at the same time, I'm getting an alert, so uh, let's put that together and see what action we should take. I don't think for Columbia there was an action it could take, it was too late. But one could imagine that uh, systems could um, take this kind of abstracted alerts into, uh, into analysis and then make a decision that otherwise would simply not be available uh, because of the fact that this hierarchy of abstractions is not in place. So anyway, it's just food for thought. This slide will not be in the deck because, uh, because I don't think it's appropriate, but I wanted to show it to you in case uh, you'd be interested in seeing that. Um, so let's look at a final example and then if there's time, I have till 2.30 or 2.35, then uh, my colleague will give a demonstration of it, very simple, just to show you kind of what it would look like. And so we get into some Java code real quick, but the example is runners. So here are runners with smart watches, and they're digital twins, and at the same time that it's processing events, looking for, uh, for feedback to give to the runners, then it's also doing data parallel analysis to get aggregate statistics and using that as part of the analysis. So for example, if you're looking at people's heart rates by age, and you know, you're finding out, well, gee, we have 100,000 runners, and all the ones that are 40 to 60, 
you know, um, that are running at this pace have a heart rate no higher than 130, and then you have some outlier uh, that's, you know, that's at 150, and then, you know, you can provide that feedback that within the digital twin that, hey, aggregate statistics say you're way high, and so you can then look at the context, oh, medications, oh, um, you know, previous injuries, conditions, et cetera, and you can make a decision in this analysis algorithm, I think I should alert that runner that maybe they should slow down or stop or see a doctor. Or you could send an alert directly to medical personnel if necessary. So let's look at some Java. Just to give you a feeling for what, when we talk about digital twins, what do we really mean? And this is a very abstracted, simplified example for exposition. But the idea here is that you have a digital twin object. So this is what's stored in the grid and it's got a bunch of stuff in it. But one thing to point out is this is the heart rate collection. So it's getting heart rate telemetry from the watch. So there's a collection of events. And that will be processed by a time windowing algorithm, which is built in as a library. And that will do posting and eviction uh, based on the time windowing policy that this application is using. And then there's context. So we talk about all this other context. Well, there's other information, medications, past heart rate, heart incidents. You know, they're their average heart rate. You could just imagine all of this context that would go along. Now this is where, with a traditional stream processing environment, first of all, you know, the, you're going to be processing an event and storing it in some ad hoc way or pushing it down the pipeline. But if you're going to store that in a cache, it's going to be off somewhere else and you have to go get it. But here, when the event comes in for execution, all the data you need about that runner is in one place at one time. And also, none of it is being shipped out. So there's no network overhead. So this just gives you an idea of what does a heart rate event uh, look like, what does an alert look like, and it's, you know, it's just very simple. This is telling you the progress and the workout and the heart rate, and it could have lots of other information. Um, and then the, this is an alert that would go to medical personnel if there was an incident. So uh, now I wanted to show you what it would take to set up the ReactiveX pipeline. This is really kind of product specific, but it's, um, it just gives you the flavor for it. The idea here is that you create an observer this is a reactive X observer. And the main thing is that it's going to, when an event comes in, it's going to deserialize it and then call um, an application-defined method. So this is where the encapsulation occurs, because all of this stuff in here is encapsulated in a clean object-oriented um, fashion, uh, and that can hold in it you know, a machine learning algorithm. Now, secondarily, uh, you set up the pipeline by uh, creating a startup action and then spinning up an invocation grid. We looked at all those invocation grid workers. And so what happens here with this one line of code here, this builder code, when you say load, it's going to start a bunch of JVMs and it's going to pass them these jars with the code. And then it's going to run the startup action, which is defined here, which is to create a new observer. Pretty simple, right? What's amazing is that this is a data parallel operation too, if you will, because it's building a whole invocation grid with one line of code. Now, the next step is event handling, right? So um, to post an event, you just post an event to an observer uh, with ReactiveX. So this is a Java API for ReactiveX. And then, um, then the next step is that you, the observer runs the application-specific code. So this is all application code for processing a running event. The thing I want to call out to you is that that's where you actually read the object out of the grid. But because of the correlation of the event sending it to the right host, to the right observer, that's going to be a local access, and it might come right out of a client cache. So that's a very fast retrieve of the object from the grid. That's the digital twin object. And then the analysis is performed, and then the digital twin object is updated if it changed. So very, very simple. This is just to give you a flavor for the analysis. So if you look in that previous slide, it's going to do some analysis. So what is that? What are we doing? Well, the first thing you're going to do is create time windows of the event collection using a policy. And then you're going to add the, this line here, adds the new heart rate event to the collection and performs uh, according to the policy and does eviction. And the next step is to do some analysis. This just shows you time window analysis. So analyzing the average heartbeats for several time windows uh, of the event collection. So you're going to collect some information about the event and how it, it's related to other events, getting average heart rate across a set of events looking back. And then finally, you're going to do some detailed analysis with that information of the user's context. So that information we're storing about the user. So now I'll switch to English from Java. So uh, um, 
so this are some of the things you can do. It, it's very intriguing, some of the things you can do with having context available. So you can take into account the, the type of exercise they're doing and the specifics, like are they climbing a hill? You can look at their medical history, re, uh, injuries, and other um, heart-related events. You can look at uh, their previous exercise history. So what, what did you have them do for training over the last several weeks or months? Um, and then you can look at these aggregate statistics for everybody to sort of see, are they on track relative to other people, or are they way off track? Is there a problem that they should be alerted to? And then you can notify them or medical personnel or just make reports to, ana to analysts. So now notice what's happening is this data parallel analytics is being performed at the same time the event processing is occurred, occurring and feedback is being generated to the grid and to the digital twin objects. So lastly, how do you do this data parallel analytics, right? So the first step is you create this data parallel method. Again, this is all very nicely object-oriented. Um, it actually uses the, the guy who did this used the same method of merge called merge for both the evaluation and for the actual merge, and that might be confusing. But in the first case, it's adding aggregate statistics to an empty merge object, and then in the second one, it's actually doing a binary merge from a, a one merge object to another result. So, but you can see that uh, all we're doing here is implementing an interface with two methods and then kicking that off. Um, this shows a little more detail. What's interesting about this, the reason I put it up here, is this is the actual uh, method that's collecting the statistics. It's doing the group by uh, without a formal MapReduce. So you can do ad hoc MapReduce. So collect statistics by groups. Uh, so it's important to understand that, you know, if you're doing a simple group by, you don't have to run formal MapReduce. And then lastly, all this is kicked off with one line of code called invoke. So it takes a collection of digital twin objects, runs invoke, passes parameters to it, and then gets the result back. And the result then is put in the grid. So that makes it available for feedback to the digital twin objects, which can read that object and read it client cache so it's very fast. Or it can be pushed out to a dashboard and shown to, to managers or analysts. So it's pretty simple. Um, and it runs in parallel on the grid, and the binary merge takes place with logarithmic time. OK, so last two slides and then a wrap up. So what we're getting here is very nice parallel speed up, because we can process events in parallel. We can do data parallel analytics, and it's all integrated. And, and then we can provide feedback to the system. That's the key insight that I'm trying to bring to this talk is that you can use data parallel analytics to give you feedback for event processing. They all could be integrated together. And by avoiding the network bottleneck that you would have with a traditional streaming uh, platform, you avoid this tail off in throughput as the workload gets higher and you can maintain linear throughput scaling. That's a, a stock back testing example, but it's the same concept. So to avoid network overhead, the model also moves all the all the work into the grid instead of doing it outside the grid. So I'm going to do a wrap up and then I think you have five minutes to give a talk. So I'll do this in 10 seconds. So the challenge we see is that traditional state stream processing, when you read the literature today, doesn't give you a software architecture to hang your hat on and to organize the code. Uh, the digital twin model solves that problem in a very elegant and powerful way and it provides a basis for encapsulation, a basis for correlation of incoming events and a basis for scaling, both for event processing and for data parallel analytics. And it provides a nice domain by which you can perform data parallel analytics, so you now have a set of objects on which you can collect statistics and provide feedback. So I think it's a really interesting step forward. Maybe it's not the next generation, but it's at least a step forward in stateful stream processing with a very nice concept that dates back to 2002. So with that, let's just have